What free speech is and how we should go about using or limiting it has been a contentious subject on campuses across the country. Chico State invited the University of California Berkeley Dean Erwin Chemerinsky to the campus to speak about speech. You'll notice what I didn't mention is a category of unprotected speech. Hate speech. That's because hateful speech is generally protected by the First Amendment. Chemerinsky heads the Berkeley Law School and has written books about free speech before and has extensive knowledge on the topic. We caught up with him after the speech for an interview. In your opinion, has free speech in our society increased or decreased? Of course, it's compared to when and compared to what. But I would say over the course of American history, there's been much more protection for free speech. I think if you look at the Supreme Court over the course of American history, it's become increasingly more speech protective. Great. Um, and, you know, you kind of touched on people feeling threatened by free speech, but I have heard arguments that unbridled free speech can lead to actual and physical harm to people, and then that is the reason why we should limit forms of hate speech or, you know, um, really aggressive speech in that manner. Um, how do you feel about that argument? There's no evidence that stopping hate speech has any relationship to stopping violence. And in fact, you look at societies that have prohibited hate speech, and it's not as if they have less violence. There's even an argument that says that it's much better to let ideas be expressed than to suppress them and have them go underground and gain popularity by virtue of that. What can you tell us about the role social media platforms have in limiting free speech or providing uh, sort of breeding grounds for really aggressive and hateful free speech, like YouTube taking videos down or 4chan um, kind of allowing alt-right memers to, you know, kind of run or eye. Social media is such a unique and powerful platform for speech. There are more people on Facebook than the entire population of North America. Speech can be for good things, but speech can also be for bad things. If speech had no effects, we wouldn't be protecting it as a fundamental right. And so speech can educate us, uplift us, but speech can also be used to spread hate. And with regard to social media platforms, we've got to remember that freedom of speech limits what the government can do. Things like Facebook and Twitter, YouTube, are not part of the government, so principles of free speech don't apply directly to them, at least the First Amendment. I was wondering if you could elaborate um you know, I've previously read it online before when you mentioned the University of Michigan and how it kind of backlash on the very people it was meant to protect. And I was kind of bummed out when you mentioned it in your speech because I was like, I was going to have a question that you didn't talk about. But um, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on that for the people watching and um, sure. tell them what it re really happened and why. The experience under hate speech laws should give us real pause. So often, hate speech laws are used against the very groups they're meant to protect. For instance, the University of Michigan, after a series of ugly racist incidents, adopted a hate speech code. Between the time it was enacted and the time it was declared unconstitutional in federal court, every enforcement action under it, without exception, was against African Americans and Latinos. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about Antifa and how it's what's been kind of the climate on Berkeley, you know, and Atifa, Antifa specifically attacking what seems to be free speech. There is never a First Amendment right to engage in violence. Antifa came onto the Berkeley campus to engage in violence. That's not protected by the First Amendment. Antifa was doing this to try to silence a speaker. That's never protected by the First Amendment. And so I think Antifa is the opposite of what freedom of speech and discourse should be all about. Something that kind of struck me is that it seems like Antifa has an inherent uh, hypocrisy in the way they go about projecting their message that by limiting free speech of people like Milo Yiannopoulos or Ben Shapiro, they're kind of fighting free speech in the name of tolerance, it seems like to me. And I was wondering if you, if you have a similar thought or if you can elaborate on that. Of course, Antifa is an anarchist group. It's hard to attribute an ideology to an anarchist group because it's the very definition of anarchism that it rejects ideology. 
But I think that what free speech rests on is a belief in tolerance, that we should be tolerant of views other than ours, that the only way we can have the right to speak tomorrow is to protect the speech we don't like today. If you could talk a little bit about the Citizens United case, for Citizens United versus the Federal Election um, Commission, and I was wondering, do you think that the Supreme Court was right in saying that money is a form of free speech? In 1976, in Buckley versus Vallejo, the Supreme Court said that spending money in election campaigns is speech. I disagree with that. I think spending money is a form of conduct that communicates a message. It's not in itself speech. We've all heard the expression, money talks, but I think that's a figurative expression that the Supreme Court took too literally in saying that money is speech. Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission was a 2010 decision, and there the Supreme Court held that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money to get the candidates they like elected or the candidates they want, want defeated and oppose them. Um, I, I'm very critical of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. I think it ignores the tremendous inequality in wealth in our society. Corporations always could spend money in elections. They just had to create a political action committee to do it. What Citizens United means is that corporations can spend money out of the corporate treasuries and do so in unlimited amounts to get candidates elected or defeated. Do you feel that that has a way in harming our own form of free speech by supporting candidates who are more like-minded to us uh, that we are going to vote for, do you think that in a sense that that has harmed our free speech by, because we are not paying for that speech with thousands or millions of dollars? My fear is that when there's a huge amount of corporate money in an election, it will drown out other speech. I worry of the candidates who will never run for office because they're worried about the corporate wealth that's right against them. I worry in the context of judicial elections that corporations are electing judges who will then do their bidding on the bench. I was part of a lawsuit, this may be of interest, that just settled two weeks ago. A jury in Illinois awarded a billion dollar damage judgment against State Farm for directing that cars be repaired with inferior parts. The Illinois Court of Appeals affirmed the judgment. State Farm spent a great deal of money, often through subterfuges, to get a justice elected to the Illinois Supreme Court who would vote in their favor. They succeeded. Justice Carmeier got elected. He overturned the judgment against State Farm. A lawsuit was then brought against State Farm saying that it was engaged in a corrupt conspiracy. And the case just settled for $250 million against State Farm about 10 days ago. What was your role in that case? I was one of many lawyers involved in representing the plaintiffs against State Farm. Nice job. I, I don't get much credit. The other, I, I, I was one of many lawyers. I had a certain piece of it I was involved in. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk about the current administration's role in bringing such raw topics like free speech and hate speech to the forefront of our campuses, um, cities, and really young people, old people, it's, it really seems like everyone's all of a sudden been engaged in free speech since the administration has come around. Free speech on campus and issues about it long precedes the Donald Trump presidency. Free speech issues on campus have been around as long as there have been colleges and universities. One of my greatest criticisms of President Trump is the way in which he's changed discourse. There's never been a president who has expressed such nastiness and meanness. And I worry that that then sets an example for people. I think we've got to find a way to disagree with one another without being disagreeable. In your opinion, how can we go about using free speech to create positive and inclusive communities on campus and in the wider communities that we live in? The key is that all voices should be heard on campus. To me, it's so important that campuses be a place where Everyone feels comfortable expressing their ideas. It doesn't matter to me if it's liberal or conservative or where it is on the political spectrum. And I think we have to be concerned that traditionally underrepresented groups have felt silenced. And we need to take steps to make sure that their voices are heard too. Mr. Jim thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>